Okay, so we come to the final example, uh, which is the inverse problem of integration or differentiation. So simply put, we want to take the first derivative of a function, and we'll see that this is an improperly posed problem. First, let's uh, formulate the opera operators. Um, we have an operator R that's meant to be integration or taking the indefinite integral or antiderivative. So uh, that should be, for us, that should be um, a continuous function. So uh, that should be some function on C naught of zero and one. And uh, we want it to be something like, well, the integral over zero of x f of t dt. Um, so uh, the outcome will be in C1. That will definitely be differentiable if f is continuous. So uh, r should be an operator from C0 to C1. Okay, and uh, of course, in the following, defined in the following way, our f at some point x is defined as the, as the integral for 0 to x f of t dt. Uh, now that's a uh, um, properly defined operator. Um, it doesn't make, it doesn't really make sense for applications, and uh, I'll tell you why in a second. But um, anyway, mathematically, it's properly defined. OK, uh, we'll do one thing. And uh, ah, uh, what about the norms? Um, I need to furnish these spaces with norms. And I take the infinity norm in both. Now, you might ask, why don't you take the infinity norm also in the uh, in C1? Why don't you take the um, C1 norm in C1? We'll also see that in a second. OK, so we have the infinity norm in both. And let me first prove that uh, this operator is uh, continuous. First, I do that uh, in the standard way of functional analysis by showing that uh, the operator R is bounded. So uh, let's do it in the following way. Um, the norm of Rf, that's uh, the sup over all uh, x. of this integral, which is smaller than this, because x is smaller than well, is smaller or equal to 1. Now, this is smaller. Uh, f of t is uh, x uh, sup over all x is gone. Uh, the absolute value of f of t is smaller than the infinity norm of f. So this is uh, equal. This is less than one times the infinity norm of f, and uh, that means well, r is continuous. OK. Uh, what we're always interested in is uh, what is the effect of small errors? So uh, if f is furnished with a small error, um, then uh, what does that mean for the, uh, for the result? What does that mean for rf? And uh, I will also just show you that this is, of course, extremely closely related. Um, Let's say we have some f tilde, which is f plus n. So f is the uh, original function, but we don't know it completely or correctly for any reason. And uh, so there is some noise added, which might have uh, some certain um, properties. And then, of course, we have that rf tilde minus rf. That would somehow be the error when evaluating the R on the wrong 
um, uh, on the wrong function that's less or equal than well let's let's say it's first equal to rf plus rn minus rf and that's of course valid for all linear operators so that's norm of rn and uh, according to what we computed up there this is small or equal to the infinity norm of the noise so uh, we see that whenever we have a continuous operator uh, then um, the effect uh, of uh, of noise is limited by that function we had with, uh, by that uh, parameter that we had over here, right? So uh, um, if we have uh, for this concrete operator for integration, the error in, uh, uh, in the result in, in the integral will never be larger than uh, the error in the data, if we call uh, n the error in the data. Okay. So uh, this is nice. So again, R is continuous and the error when evaluating F, uh, well, evaluating R on uh, uh, some function that has an error itself is limited. Okay. Good, so this is extremely nice. So integration is a nice operator. That's what we expected. Um, now, what happens with the inverse? Well, as I said, uh, if we take f to be continuous, then it's guaranteed that rf is uh, in C1, that it's actually differentiable. Um, this is nice, but as I said, we won't be able to, let, let's assume uh, we want to solve the inverse problem. So what we measure is rf, what we measure is the integral, and we want to go back to the original function. That means we want to, do, we want to take the first derivative of that function. Um, first of all, that might not be that easy, because even uh, if it's guaranteed that rf is differentiable, uh, this is probably not the exact function that we measure. So um, as I said, we have something like uh, f plus n, or in our case, that would be given, first of all, I want to formulate the inverse problem, given Rf, compute F. Okay, so uh, what we have to do, obviously, this is just uh, the R to the minus one, and this should, of course, be G, R to the minus one G, is an, an upper, or let me first give you the spaces again, r to the minus one is of course an operator that now maps from C1 to C0. And of course it does nothing but take the derivative, so r to the minus one of some function g in C1 at some point x is defined as the first derivative of that function g. OK, that looks nice. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, properly defined. But in this case, we have a problem. Because um, even if it's guaranteed that g is in c1, we will measure an approximate g. And um, if there's some error, like uh, we measure g tilde equals to g plus n, there is some noise on it. And uh, to, for, G1, uh, for G tilde to lie in C1, we need to require that the noise is differentiable. Well, it definitely will not be. So um, taking the derivative here, uh, uh, assuming that the derivative is in C1 already is uh, a major problem. And uh, we'll see what this means numerically in the second part of this discussion. Okay, so, but for the moment, let's assume that this noise is differentiable. 
and uh, everything's fine. We can take the derivative and the inverse operator is properly defined. Okay, um, then uh, everything seems to be nice. So the first conditions of Hadamard uh, are satisfied. So we have a unique solution and also um, we have unique solution and it always exists. Right. It always exists and it's unique. Okay. So uh, the question is, is that in fact continuous? And um, um, to show that it is not, I will do the same calculation as above for some noise. And uh, I will use, well, let's, let's uh, uh, assume that our true function is uh, somewhat, uh, let g in c1, so g is differentiable on 0, 1. And what we have is... Uh, slightly distorted version of G. And let's say it's something like delta sine n times pi times x. Okay, so um, we have um, yeah, we, we look and we'll just, uh, this is a differentiable function. So G, G is differentiable and it's a sign of n pi x is uh, also differentiable. So um, let's look what's the derivative. Um, of course, G prime, uh, the derivative G um, tilde prime at some point x is given by G prime of x plus delta times n times the sine of n pi, delta n pi, sine of n pi x. Okay, and delta and n are arbitrary. I mean, uh, I assume that delta is going to be small and, um, the, uh, and n is some integer and I assume it to be large. Now, uh, again, let's ask what is the difference between g tilde, uh, between r to the minus one, g tilde prime, uh, g tilde, excuse me, minus r to the minus one g. So we're asking what is the error that we get when we apply our operator, our inverse operator, to the distorted function. Of course, that must be taken in the infinity norm. Um, now, this of course is just um, uh, G prime, uh, the R2, this is, um, whoops. Yeah, this, uh, the, the G prime leaf. So all that is left is the infinity norm of delta times N times pi times sine of n pi x and the infinity norm of that. Now, of course, the infinity norm can be calculated and this is nothing but delta times n times p times pi. I think I should have left out that pi. Okay, um, so when we have uh, the uh, what was the error of the noise? So the infinity norm of this one here. Well, I shouldn't have called it in. The infinity norm of the noise is smaller than delta. smaller than delta. The infinity norm of the error is delta times n times pi. So since n was arbitrary, I, uh, given some limit on the noise, 
like this one right here. Let me mark this. So we have an error bound on the noise, but the error in the result can be arbitrarily large because I can take n to be as large as possible. So the error in the result, the error of the operator um, uh, applied to, um, um, to uh, the distorted function is not bounded by any constant. It can be arbitrarily large. So I can just, I just need to take n uh, arbitrarily um, as large as I want. So there is no limit on the error of the, uh, there's no error, there's no error on this, there's no error bound on the result. And that means that the operator is discontinuous. Now this is more or less in the terms that are used uh, in, in these uh, measurement terms, which are always used. Uh, let's also uh, just prove of course that it's also um, discontinuous with respect to the usual functional analysis um, definition. We just need to compute what is r to the minus one. Um, r to the minus one, I need to come up with u for the function u given above as sine of n pi x, infinity norm. So this is the infinity norm of u prime. And uh, I just computed that above. That's n times pi. And of course, you will see that the norm of this is one. Uh, so, so there is no uh, C such that the norm of R to the minus one U is smaller than C times the infinity norm of U, or uh, better writing it in a better way r to the minus one u over the infinity norm of u. If r to the minus one is continuous, then this should be bounded. But uh, in fact, as we see, we can take n to be as far as we want. So uh, this is goes to infinity for n equals to inf n uh, going to infinity. So there is no upper bound for this. So r to the minus one is discontinuous. So what this means is when we take the derivative, we can have an arbitrarily small error in, uh, uh, in the data, in the function that we get, and the error in, uh, the, in the result may be arbitrarily large. Okay, so uh, definitely this is an uh, this is an inverse problem. It's an improperly posed problem, and um, we for some reason we we might have, maybe we just don't have to care. I mean, what we could come up with is, is the idea. Usually, when we take the derivative in numerical analysis, we we're taking a finite difference anyway. So uh, if everything is, uh, is, uh, um, is, is finally smooth enough that it can be, uh, that, it can be um, that you can take the derivative of it, maybe we just don't care. We, we have just an array of numbers and that's it. So um, why do we really care whether something is unbounded? Let's just do finite differences and everything is fine, right? Well, I will show you that it is not and that's going to be in the second part of this introduction.